正式な美しいシルエットで対処しています。ギャハギャハ正式な美しいシルエットで対処しています。ギャハギャハギャハギャハ White fluid, left haired, red handed gender artist.、Um, and I think I, I made this piece after the, my sister had died, and I was coming into the studio and I was like, well, who am I? And I deliberately labelled myself because some people don't like labels, they get terribly scratchy about labels, and I do too. But if I label myself, I kind of think that's okay. But I've deliberately mashed the, the, the labels up.、Um, So, white fluid, left, left haired, red handed, gender artist. Because it was like me looking in the mirror and saying, well, if I was me, that's what I, that's what I think I look like. I've got sort of ideas going on up here in my head. I'm burning with ideas.、Um, and that's what I am. I'm a white fluid, left haired, red handed, gender artist, left handed. If you want me to get it out, I will get it out. It's well known about my practice that I, I have a very limited palette. I use orange and black, which I developed about 11 years ago, I think, which, which was a way of forming a, a sort of instant dialectic between the two colours. I, I just love the, the cheeriness of orange. It has a lot of associations with fruit, with Buddhist robes, with safety, health and safety, a whole load, whole load of things, the 1970s.、Um, But beyond that, I've, I found it a very fertile territory to work with. And it makes my work recognisable, which is no bad thing, I guess. Colour is structural for me. So if I see a bulldozer, I love bulldozers and I love the, the boats down at Rock and Ore and all that sort of thing. I love that sort of industrial use of colour. So, you know, if you see a big orange thing, it's probably a bulldozer. You know, there's no, there's no flim flam about it. I'm a boy. I'm a bulldozer. I'm a work by Ben Brown. You know, 正式な美しいシルエットで対処しています。ギャハギャハギャハギャハ。It's it's part of that mystery of life, you know, that that we're told we're one thing and yet we don't we feel like something else. It's like it, it's just the basic fluidity of consciousness. And I I think、um, when I grew up it was it was a much more black and white world. You you're male, you're female,、uh, and I never felt like that. I, I I did a lot of things like. Sewing and、um, cooking and all sorts of things. Housework, I don't do housework, but、um, that, th that meant that I was sort of breaking boundaries in some way, or the clothes that I chose to wear were not from my given gender and stuff like that. So I just think it's been a sort of lifelong fascination with slippage again, you know, it's a slippage between the norms.、Um, and You know, it's become clearer and clearer as I've got older and older. There is no norm. There is no normal. Normal is just what's imposed by religion or politics or whoever, whatever, as a means of control. And that in the, in the West, we've suffered from, hugely from the Victorian era, which put prohibitions on a whole load of stuff,、uh, especially around male、um, image and appearance. And I feel much more comfortable in this world because. The general populace have learnt about these things through the media, so there's less stigma attached, and that's a good thing for society. You know, I have to find ways of dealing with a sort of fetishism. I mean, that's, that's I grew, sort of went to college and we talked about the fetishism, which was, which was part Freudian and part to do with. African statues they put nails in and things. But you know, I sort of understand fetishism to mean things we're attracted to, things that we're constantly wanting to be close to. And I think you can have fetishism for materials, you can have fetishism for plywood, you can have, you know, it, it, it's the, just the things that make you passionate. So I, I just think it's that constant battle to make materials, material, interesting. To have a sensuality about it without overstating it, you know.、Um, so, th just that little dialogue between two different materials gives you so much energy in, in, for the eyes and for the mind and stuff. It's, it's fun. I was working on this piece、um, before my father died, and I wasn't really sure what direction it was going to go in. And so, I finished this piece off. N not, I wasn't thinking too much about. 
the subject or my father, it's not, it doesn't look like my father. It's a general homage to, to males for their ability to fertilize the ovum. I, I'm very fascinated by this pom-pom trimming. So that sort of trimming is called passamentary. There you go. And it's a way of sort of slightly glamorizing furniture. I've always been a great fan of the, um, the turntable. So these are very slow turntables. This is actually um, a sort of over life size rubber glove, currently provisionally entitled Gloveliness, which is a play on the word loveliness, obviously. It doesn't cost me much. So I mix rabbit skin glue with this, DAS, and it becomes much, much harder. I'm really looking forward to finishing this, you know, to getting some colour on this. And I want it to be nice and glossy and sexy and stuff. So um, that's in progress. I've started to sand it, which means I'm getting towards that process of applying finishing coats. I've been kind of interested in what harms us. And I think that that's part of my philosophy of life as well is, you know, what harms us, what's, what's good thought, what's bad thought, what's good action, what's bad action. I think that was when he kind of got that I, he understood that I was in a very different place from him in terms of how I saw the world and how I was intending to try and make a living in the world because he was a, my, my father was a, a lovely man, a bit mysterious like many middle class fathers of his generation, a bit emotionally distant. <laughs> So I think my father was a bit sort of mystified by it all. Um, and he used, I think he probably left the aesthetic things in life to my mother who knitted and crocheted and drew and painted and all sorts of things. Um, but I think when he saw my show and the scale of the works I produced, because I'd done some quite big wall pieces for this show, I think he suddenly realized there was a sort of, perhaps a, a sort of gulf between us. But I think he then went on to see everything I was as a human being was mediated by art, which was something he wasn't particularly familiar with. So in a way it kind of, it, it led me to accept we had a bit of a gulf between us. And my puppet here. He particularly, I made a piece some years ago, which is over there somewhere, which was a, a, a facsimile of me as, as, as um, a sort of warped, punch, so I've got a glove puppet of me called Mr. Orange. Right, so we've, we do have uh, Mr. Orange. It's a facsimile of a piece I made in 2009 called Visionary Smoke, which was a photo shoot in uh, Rockinore. And I was photographed in a cave, Michael's cave in Rockinore. Um, and so... <laughs> So that's the, um, the, the lollipop that Mr. Orange can uh, wave at people and hit them with. Well, I modelled it from my own face. Um, so behind the mask is my face as well. And I cast the mask. In the visionary soap, I'm wearing a mask which was cast from my own face. So with this, I modelled the face and then I made a cast from the face of the puppet. So if I took that mask off, you would probably think it looked somewhat like me. <laughs> I mean, this, you see, this piece has not seen the light of day since 2010, you see. So you forced the light onto this piece for the first time in what is now 11 or 12 years. Yeah, and that's what my father liked, was the Mr. Orange puppet. Years afterwards, you say, how's Mr. Orange coming along? How's Mr. Orange? For some reason, that was the work that he loved most. Maybe because he could see Punch and, he'd seen Punch and Judy shows and... I think he engaged in the humour. I think he loved the fact that I'd made a little me um, that do, really did look very like... It does look very like me. Um, 
And I, think, I, I just think that's the piece that resonated most with him. And it's not like a classic piece of art, but it, it's, it's, it, it, for me, it's a very, very good piece, but I, I have never exhibited it, but I, I hang on to it for dear life because it's, it's very meaningful. It's a self-portrait. I love that world in miniature. I love that the Punch and Judy is a world in miniature, and it's a very vicious little world in miniature. All these places like art, art galleries, theatres, Punch and Judy shows, all these places where you get a kind of life condensed and concentrated into, into that sort of mm, universal truth is really, really interesting. I, th I think that feeds into the way my art, I make my art, you know, it's all about narrative. There's a narrative there. There's a history behind the objects I create. There's, there's, there's all of me and there's all of my hands and my heart and my soul going into those works. I did have another cast of characters which were loosely based on the Punch and Judy um, show. You've got to have a skeleton in there. I was going to have a skeleton. <laughs> that Mark French comes in my studio, gets me opening all sorts of boxes and I have to close them again. Shocking it is. Shocking it is. Ah, oh, well. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Removals, off we go. be gloomy for a certain amount of time you can be contemplative about uh, for a long time a certain amount of time but action is really important and if I don't make the work it doesn't get made so I'm really happy to be back in my studio and, and operating again